Good morning, everybody. Oh, that was terrible. Good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your coffee, and I think there was cake this time. Um, I just thought I'd take, spend a few minutes talking about uh, the microphone I'm wearing and how great design sometimes, A, makes me feel like Britney Spears, because I've always wanted to wear a microphone like this. And secondly, uh, my plea to the designers in the audience, please can you make sure you have one of these that's beard coloured? Because actually this is supposed to be flesh coloured, and actually you can see it for people at the back who can't quite see that. So I think great design is about making microphones blend into my beard, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a few minutes before I start to say thank you to Bedegit and to Stefan and to Magnus for a fabulous occasion. I've really enjoyed myself over the last two days. But I'd also like to take time to talk about what I first experienced as an attendee when I got here a very rainy yesterday morning. It was the person at the top of the road, and some of you may well have seen this individual, with an umbrella and a badge saying, may I help you? And I thought, my God, what a great idea. A bit like the games makers they had at the Olympics in London. Somebody who was meeting and greeting and directing and getting very, very, very wet. But he did a great job. So please join me in a round of applause for all the people who've made this happen. So, um, let's, I think the green one was forward, right, if I was paying attention. So, this is my quality of life picture. So, uh, this is my cat. He's called Bobcat. He's four years old, and for me, this is about quality of life. My cat, I'm sure you'd agree, looks very contented. He looks very happy, and sometimes I wonder if I'm his pet or he is mine, because what tends to happen is uh, my cat sort of gets fed, gets fuss, and then buggers off and leaves me, and I get very little from the relationship. But in terms of what quality of life and content is me and my cat watching TV together on the sofa. And I know that sounds incredibly sad, but just a straw poll. Who's a cat person? Put your hands up. Fantastic. Who's a dog? Excellent. <laughs> Who's got some kind of pot-bellied pig or something like that? Very weird. Or a gerbil? Nobody. That's what I like to see. So... Um, Quality of life to me is about being happy and content. And hopefully during this uh, short presentation I've got for you, we'll be able to talk about what that means to me. So, giant picture of me. I'm the one with the beard. I thought that was very funny earlier on. We had a lady and a gentleman. He pointed out he was the one with the beard. But this is about me and what I've done. So back to the serious point. So I started on the shop floor when I was 15 years old, working for the UK equivalent of... Uh, Dixon's, which is, I think, in the Scandinavia, Elk Shop and El Giganten. Please forgive my terrible pronunciation. And I worked my way through the ranks, ended up being the head of marketing when I left the organisation about 10 years ago. And then I joined HSBC, one of the world's largest financial services organisations. And first and foremost, I started as global head of uh, sales development, which was basically bringing skills and experience to the frontline staff on the telephone, in store, how they could talk to customers better. How can they have conversations? How can we get the managers out of their offices in the branches onto the shop floor, meeting and greeting the customers? And then they gave me the very grandiose title, which barely fitted on my job, on my business card, Global Head of Retail Development and Design. And I'll just start by saying for the designers in the room, I'm a civilian. I cannot draw. I have got a terrible eye for colour, as you can tell from my fabulous dress sense. But what my job meant was I was in charge of around 8,500 branches worldwide, many different formats about how we bring a consistent customer experience and how we change the way that the customers are treated in store using a very clear, defined customer, customer journey. Very difficult, very complicated, and I'll talk more in a second about how I did that. Um, it was sometimes like navigating treacle, dealing with complex organizations. And I think for me, I think I learned an awful lot about how you get people to understand why they need to change, what the rational argument is, and everybody in this room, including people who think they're not rational, how you get across the emotional argument as well. How do you get people convinced that the right thing to do to change, which is great for the customer, as well as great for the business. And more recently, I work for Zap, and Zap is backed by the UK banks. I was the chief commercial officer for an organization that's bringing your debit card onto your mobile phone. It launches at the end of this year, and with lots of competition, I dealt with the banks on the outside. So convincing the UK banks to back this product, convincing the payment acquirers, the people in between the merchants and the banks, that this is right for them and they can make money from it, and convincing merchants that they need to take yet another payment type, retooling their shops, educating their staff, understanding how this makes it better for the consumer. 
But digital payments, and if you'd like to talk to me more about it afterwards, is what's going to happen over the next 12 to 18 months, if it's not already happened in your, your country at the moment. So, what am I going to talk to you about in detail after I've spent some time talking about myself? What I'd like to do this morning is talk about how you bridge the gap between insight and execution. And what do I mean by that? I've heard over the last few days some fantastic ideas about how you can improve service design, how you can make the customer experience better. But having a great idea, or what I call an intent, is great. How do you then bridge that gap between making it happen? How do you get the organization to rally around it? How do you convince the naysayers to find a way of understanding what you're trying to achieve and making it happen? On my table yesterday and today, I spoke to a number of product designers, service designers, and 3D and 2D designers around their biggest challenge is getting the organization they deal with to understand what we're trying to achieve. And it's not easy. It's very hard, very difficult. And actually, organizations, without overusing the analogy of an oil tanker, it takes a lot of time for the big organizations in particular to understand why they need to change and why it's important. But the five or six points I'm going to go through now, hopefully, they're very simple. A lot of it is logic and common sense, which is one of the things I pride myself on having. And understanding how that final foot or 500 centimeter conversation or telephone conversation or internet sale works is critical. And I pride myself on being quite unusual at quite senior level of having experienced it, having been a frontline salesperson since I was a wee lad, which was a very, very, very long time ago. So. Hello? There we go. So, this chart's from a company called Cloud Growth. This chart, for me, exemplifies not just HSBC, but some large organizations that I've dealt with over the years. And I guess, for me, the interesting thing is, um, which one of these sort of people have you come across before? Which one of these people is you, controversially? Are you one of these people without even knowing it? Or more importantly, have you come on a journey where... You've been one of these people, saw the light, hallelujah, and decided that the right thing to do was to change the organization. So, I guess for me, navigating the treacle, as I describe it, is critical to be able to say, right, how do we've got a great idea, great intent, how do you deal with these people? How do you get them to become people that work together? I've had over... 2,000 likes of this on my LinkedIn profile. I've had over 75 comments, one of the biggest reactions, and lots and lots and lots of people have shared it with their LinkedIn network as well. So I guess for me, what's happened is a lot of people recognize from this slide the sort of challenges that organizations make. So the thing I put at the top is it's not good enough to be right. And what do I mean by that? You have a great idea. You know you need to change. The organization, the senior executive team, really, really, really buys into what you're going to do. But then you've got to deal with the spongy middle. I'm paraphrasing here, but Jack Welsh, the GE uh, guy, the legendary guy, talks it, calls it the spongy middle. These are the people that absorb change and do nothing with it. And you need to find a way of making sure that convincing these people by getting buy-in, buy -in, what the business will look like when you're finished, sharing the vision, spending the time to engage with these people and convincing them it's the right thing to do. And although these are some of the examples of the type of individuals, conversely, in HSBC, I met a lot of people that were complete opposite. They recognized the business needed to change. We needed to find a way of making the organization better at how we did business. And we also needed to have a relationship with our consumers that was more adult to adult, last parent and child. But it's difficult. Organizations like HSBC, like Dixon's, are big, complex, and frankly, successful. It's about looking into the future and finding a way and saying, listen, our business is under threat, it's at risk, how do we need to change? So spending the time, in summary, to get, to get them and to understand why it's important and it's not good enough to think you're right is critical. Next one, again, no apologies for this. Giant picture of a man's ear um, without the Britney microphone, of course. But the simple brief is critical. And one of the things I learned was getting a brief that puts down in simple terms, what are you trying to achieve? And for me, again, as I say these words, and a lot of you around the room recognize what I'm saying, but it sounds pretty straightforward, very basic. But the amount of organizations I've dealt with where they've given me a brief that's 77,000 pages long, when they want to do is change the way a knob looks inside a store, is astonishing. This is about having a critical way and a critical look at your business. Why are you kicking off this project or program? 
Why is it important to the business? What difference is it going to make to the quality of life of your people internally, as well as to the quality of life of the customers you're dealing with? Share and iterate the brief. Share it around the organization. Get the brief understood by why you want to change and what difference is it going to make. Ask for views and opinions. Be very clear on the scope of the brief. And again, this is 101 guide to how you do a brief. But a lot of people, a lot of businesses, very large, complex businesses, people I consider clever, forget to do a brief in detail. Explain what the stages of change are going to be. And my final point in the brief, as you share it around the business and you iterate what you're trying to do with the brief until you get it right, be clear on what you want these people to do to help. I need your help to make this happen. This is your role within it. What do you think? Very basic, very clear, but critical stuff. It seems very obvious, and I see from a lot of faces around the room that this does seem very obvious. But you would be surprised, as a consultant now, looking at organizations externally, how many organizations I deal with where their brief is not clear. They haven't got buy-in. Somebody at senior level has made an idea, and actually the rest of the organization doesn't understand what it's for, but critically, doesn't understand what their role in is and how they can help me make this happen. And also, finally, around the brief, refer back to it. If you're through a project, whether it's six weeks, six months, six years, refer back to the brief. Don't be afraid to change the brief. It should evolve, but at the same time, be careful of scope creep, creep as well. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Creep. Thank you very much. Um, build partnerships. This is both internal and external partnerships. And I've used the example of Qmatic, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But when I mean partnerships, when I talked about the brief, stage one of building partnerships is internal partnerships. So when I was the global head of retail development and design, the scope of which, as I mentioned earlier, it was 1,000 offices, 8,500 branches, 11 different formats, massive change. But we did it, but we built partnerships with our, co our colleagues in corporate real estate, our colleagues in IT our colleagues in organizational development. HR are critical, especially when you're talking about behavioral change for people. It's absolutely critical that you build these partnerships. And again, I referred to this earlier, but it's around how do you make sure you have an adult to adult relationship with internal partners, but more importantly, when you appoint suppliers, great, fabulous service design people like we've got here today, great design agencies, great IT software companies, how do you make sure you build a partnership with them that delivers a result. And for me, Qmatic, who are one of the sponsors here today, we work together in, in partnership. And I'll, if, you, if I may, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the partnership we built together. We had a problem in HSBC. We had lots and lots of customers coming through the door, but conversion was very, very low. People were waiting too long, getting fed up. When they did wait, they were talking to the wrong sort of uh, uh, member of staff who wasn't able and equipped to talk about the right sort of product. And we didn't want the traditional cashier number three, please, approach towards how we worked together and how those customers were ranked and matched. So over a period of seven to eight months, once we'd iterated the brief, once we'd got buy-in from around the business, particularly with IT, Qmatic and myself sat in a room over a period of seven or eight months and talked about how we found a solution to this problem. And we came up with the idea of Matchmaker. And Matchmaker, what it did was, customer comes in, you qualify the customer, what are they looking for today, what sort of product do they need, and we match the right member of staff to the right customer using, a, in effect, a queuing system, but a dynamic, intelligent queuing system that changed the way that the customers are treated when they came in store. The win-win situation was customer satisfaction went up, conversion increased massively, customers were happy with us, we gave them a hassle-free experience, improved their quality of life, but also, more importantly, we came up with a solution the market had never seen before. It moved away from the traditional, here's cashier number three, please, which is still important in some scenarios, to a sophisticated, dynamic, and interesting way for the customers to be matched to the right member of staff, to increase conversion, and to drive up customer satisfaction, as well as making the customer happy when they dealt with HSBC in-store, as well as online. But the lesson here is about the partnership piece. If we'd gone to the market, done a standard tender, we would have got the same old stuff that was out there today. And there are a number of other examples where I've worked with companies like Humatic, like some of the biggest design agencies in the world, some of the biggest digital agencies, where 
I have a relationship with them where we talk about how we make things better for the customer in a world where we've got a financial return to deliver. We haven't got a blank checkbook, I'm sorry to, to tell you that, but it's about making sure that you find a way of building partnerships with these external suppliers in an adult-to-adult -adult way, not in a parent and child, which traditionally where, if some of you, your organizations have procurement teams, that's what tends to happen. But it's incredibly important that you use specialists for key management. It was, it was companies like Qmatic for design. It was the likes of Fitch and Edge and some of the big globe, global design companies. But it's about choosing the right organization that has the right personality profile and type to work with your organization as well. And why is that important in terms of bridging, bridging the gap between intent and execution? Because if you, if you don't look at the sort of organization you use, you don't work in partnership, then you get a result that seems a little mediocre and doesn't achieve your objectives. Spending that time is critical. So, again, I apologize to the designers in the room, but it's not always just about color. So, for me, I think what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here is, what's the difference in terms of, sorry, I'll start again. So, Terence Conran, he was on the radio last week. And Terence Conran is a legend. He's the guy, for, I'm sure most of you know who Terence Conran is. Uh, sorry, forgive me, Sir Terence Conran. Sir Terence Conran is one of the 20th and 21st century's most recognized and most respected designers in the world. He's come up with some iconic furniture, some iconic household goods, created the brand Habitat, which I understand was bought by Ikea in the end, if that's correct, and still runs a small chain of shops called the Conrad Store in the UK. And he was asked the question, what's the difference between a decorator and a designer? Anybody know? Thank you very much for your input. So, the difference between a decorator and a designer from Terence Conran's point of view was a decorator does great coloring in, does fabulous design, whether it's digital, whether it's stores. A fabulous designer worries about the detail. And what he meant by that, I understood, was a great designer worries about the detail of how the customer feels, the emotional relationship they have with your design or your service design in this case. And it's critical that we understand that design isn't just about winning awards. One of the first things I used to do when employing a design agency, both digital and physical, was, guys, I'm not here to win awards. I'm here to make sure we deliver to our brief, which we'd spent the time building partnerships and doing properly. But it's interesting, a lot of people get blinded by the color. And it's less about the design organizations, more about internally. I had examples when I worked for HSBC where we would have a design workshop for the internal management, the middle, spongy middle I talked about earlier, and they would bring with them copies of, or examples, actually physically, the carpet they liked. Yeah, some of you may have experienced this, the curtains from home. I had one example where we were doing a premier branch, which is the high net worth premier branches, of which there are about 1,000 around the world for HSBC, where somebody brought along a lamp from their house, and he said, I'd like this in every single branch around the world. You cannot design by committee. Leave that to the specialists and the professionals. But I think what tends to happen is people focus on design, and you can't design by committee. It's focusing on the brief. And in my experience, it's critical that you focus on the brief and not allow people to think they can do design when people like you, who we employ, do a much better job of spending lots and lots of time and experience getting it right. The other thing that used to bother me was I'd have meetings with design agencies and they'd come along with this formulate design that wasn't tailored for my business, that was something I'd seen elsewhere, and they'd just done it in red, black, and blue with the corporate colors of HSBC. And also, you know, showing it around the business, it's critical when you present the design, whether it's a website or whether it's a store, that we don't get into conversations about, and I had senior executives in some South American markets tell me I don't like the color. Or in Asia, particularly if it was too black, it would be that's the color of death. Or if it was in South America, we don't like red, it's the color of blood. And it went on and on and on. And it's critical to refer back to the brief. And I think we need to be clear about it's more than just color. It's about making a difference to the, color, to the customer and about referring back to the brief as well. And I love the Terence Conrad analogy. Please feel free to Google it. I think it's now online as well. But it's about worrying about the details is the message I'm going to leave you with when I talk about color. Am I pointing this in the right way? Oh, there we go. So, this is something I spent a long time thinking about. I Googled it, I looked at it, and I spent a long time explaining what customer experience was internally at HSBC. Because a lot of people thought it was about complaints. How do we stop getting complaints? How do we deal with complaints? A lot of, cust a lot of people thought it was around, you know, how do we make sure they get served quickly? But actually for me, it's about, and this is the best expression I think I've ever found, 
Customer experience is the premeditated design of what your customer experience is when doing business with you from beginning to end. And I think the key messages here I'd like you to take away are premeditated design of what your customer experience is. And for me, it's also, you know, we talked about the rational, we talked about the emotional. It's about how the customer feels when they do business with you. How do you make them feel? Do they feel delighted? Do you exceed expectations? But customer experience has many different meanings. And I would urge you, when you discuss this with your internal uh, customer, or indeed if you're a third-party supplier talking to them, use, use their language. Yeah? If you're talking to finance, talk in finance terms. If you're talking to the design team, of course, use design. But if you're talking to marketing, they want to understand what the net promoter score is. But actually, the summary of what I've got here is premeditated design of what your customer experience is from beginning to end. And for me, that resonated with me about what customer experience meant and what difference it made. And the final piece, and I thought about this long and hard because we had a conversation at HSBC and at Dixon's, why are we doing this? What do we want to achieve? And there was the same stuff. There was the metrics, net promoter score. There was brand and what they thought of the brand and how far up it was. But when I used to buy stuff before social media, I am that old, and there is a little bit of gray in my beard, you can see. I think it was critical that I go out and ask people what they recommended. You know, what sort of car should I buy? Do you know a great builder? Do you know a great plumber? And I always ask people. These days, you have TripAdvisor and all the ilk that talk about recommendation. I would never, ever, ever stay in a hotel these days without checking TripAdvisor first. But actually, if you're doing a great job with customer experience, would your customers recommend you above all others? Would your customers recommend you? And for me, at the end of any project or program you're doing about creating great customer experience, using great service design, would your customer recommend you? And for me, it is critical that we look at this through everything we do and thread it through the programs of activity. So my final slide. Yes, it's nearly over. Logic and common sense. This is my final point. I dealt with an organization where I'd sit around a table and there would be people from Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford, all the great universities around the world, and there's little old me who went to technical college and started a degree in law at Birmingham University, and I would feel the least academic. But these guys are bright and intelligent and deal with very complex issues, and they're up here somewhere in terms of intellectual prowess. I was somewhere down here. But actually, what I added to the party was I'm a bit more random than they are. They spoke like this, and they talked in those terms. I was a bit more over the place. But actually, what I brought to the party was logic and common sense. And what I mean by that is I did a workshop with senior executives. We designed a branch, and they forgot to stick a door in the branch when we did the design at the end of it because they don't think in simple customer terms about why we'd, why we'd be re-recommended. But the cartoon is very clear. The voice of the customer is on line two. Take a message on being customer-centric. Now, this cartoon, to me, explains why you should always talk to your customers, why you should understand what your customers want without using the buzzwords, which is why I took the time to explain what customer experience is and why, for me, it's critical to understand how you bridge that gap between insight and execution. So, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>